Okay, everyone. It's Brittany and welcome to or back to my channel. In this video, I'm talking all about my love for Sam Raimi's 2002 Spider-Man. As a nine-year-old girl in 2002, something like Spider-Man was probably the last thing I ever thought I'd be into. I'm still not sure how, when, or why I even saw this movie for the first time, and I'm even more unsure of how a VHS tape of the film ended up in my possession all those years ago, but it did. And I was a kid lucky enough to have a TV VCR in my room, and I watched Spider-Man repeatedly. This movie made me love Spider-Man and the concept of the character. This movie is the reason why I've physically gone to see every Spider-Man film in theaters ever since. Going into this video essay, I started to wonder, what is it about Spider-Man that I love so much? Not just the character, but this movie specifically. It's one of my top four favorites of all time. I like to think that each of my top movies represents some facet of myself, but I never pause to actually consider what elements of Spider-Man I connect with. Spider-Man always seemed like a bit of an outlier. Now let me make something very clear before I continue. The point of this video is for me to explain what Spider-Man means to me and why I love Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. But in order to fully do that, I feel like you need to know what I dislike in comparison. Moving on. When I hear the words superhero movie, I automatically think of a very specific look and feel. The only word I can think of to really describe what I mean is shiny. They're just very shiny, literally and figuratively. Yeah, what's up with that? If you told me that all of those clips were from the same movie, I'd believe you. Scenes like those are just a small example of the common familiarity that these movies share today. But I personally find it really difficult to get invested in these movies, and I've tried, but I ultimately just have a very, um, what's the word? Drowsy relationship with superhero and action movies, but there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. Do each his own. Hopefully that's enough to just give you a little idea of why it's always been sort of strange to me that Spider-Man, classified as a superhero movie, would be one of my top four favorites of all time. But once I seriously thought about it, it started to make a whole lot of sense. Firstly, I believe that Raimi's Spider-Man films were crafted with the intention of reaching beyond the superhero movie audience because there wasn't really a superhero movie audience at the time, or at least the audience wasn't anywhere near as big as it is today. The Raimi films were Spider-Man's big screen debut. He had to prove that Spider-Man could work in live action motion pictures. They had to be films that could reach out to everyone, including people who might not be all that interested in superhero movies and try to make them interested. The best way to do that is to appeal to more than one type of moviegoer. As Roger Ebert once said about Spider-Man 2, this is a superhero movie for people who don't go to superhero movies. I'm telling my friends, oh, they say, oh, I don't want to see Spider-Man. I say, you might be surprised. Yes, you do. As soon as I heard that, I was like, oh my God, that is it. That statement can totally be applied to Spider-Man 1 as well. They are movies that try to be as logical and relatable as possible within a fantastical concept. Superhero films typically do fall under the umbrella of action films. However, there is very little action here. In fact, there's only roughly about 20 minutes of it in this two hour movie. I timed it. This movie is just really well paced and the action is tastefully distributed. The action and fight sequences last just the right amount of time and they always help propel the story. They never go on too long, which is usually what puts me to sleep and they never feel too short. 
Spider-Man is essentially a story-driven movie with some action in it and not an action-driven movie with some story in it. I'm so glad Raimi went in the direction that he did, otherwise I would not have bought into the idea of Spider-Man as much as I did. Over time, I've seen and heard lots of people say less than favorable things about this movie. I was worried I might feel differently upon re-watching Spider-Man, and I know some people will just chalk it up to nostalgia, and while I am a very nostalgic person, I really do believe that this is a pretty great film and a near-perfect introduction to Spider-Man. So let's talk about it. The biggest struggle for me was in trying to figure out how to pull off a living, breathing Spider-Man. Sam Raimi was able to craft a movie so unique in tone and unique visually. I mean, this is a movie that is incredibly campy and off-the-wall insane at times, yet it's also serious and realistic. It's colorful, upbeat, quirky, and just what you'd want out of a comic book movie, but it's also a little dark. It's funny, sometimes unintentionally, but nothing is forced. It's just naturally funny and a lot more than I remembered. Some of my favorite moments would probably have to include the Amazing Spider-Man! I was in the neighborhood. I took two buses and a cab to get in the neighborhood, but... Go Web! Fly! There's no featherweight division here, small fry. Next! I'm a photographer. Yes, I can see that. Oh, my legs! Oh, God, I can't feel my legs! I cried like a baby when you played Cinderella. Peter, that was first grade. Ah, some kind of freaky Lewis something. Well, I could do. Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. These weirdos all gotta have a name now. But at the same time, it's packed with emotion and maturity. And it accomplishes everything pretty seamlessly, in my opinion. And for that, it truly stands out. The entire movie just emanates a very genuine and warm vibe, and it's ultimately just very pure. This movie is sentimental and story-driven, and a little less action-packed spectacle like we've come to expect from superhero movies. But I think Raimi proved that superhero flicks could and maybe should be more. That it's okay to focus less on the super stuff and more on the human hero. That's something that I really, really appreciate and definitely contributes to my love for the movie. I mentioned that modern superhero movies feel shiny to me, so in contrast, there is a rawness to Raimi's Spider-Man that really sets it apart even further. Not just simply due to it being shot on film, although that's probably part of it. And yeah, when you compare it to its modern successors, it's a little over the top. Hello, my dear. Some of the CGI doesn't totally hold up. Some of the fight sequences are <laughs> clearly choreographed. There are some pretty cheesy lines. It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. And the acting isn't always the greatest. Deliver! Finish it! But under that, this really is such an awesome origin story with a lot of character, charm, and heart. And I think that's what makes Raimi's Spider-Man so special and easier for me to connect to. It feels like an original, standalone movie made with love and mainly driven by one person's vision and creative control. But this really is such a fun origin story, which is one of the reasons why I've always preferred Spider-Man 1 to the sequels. Now, I can totally see some other aspects that are maybe a little dated or haven't aged well, and I fully acknowledge them. I'm not wearing nostalgia glasses that shield me from any of that, and thankfully there aren't that many moments. But this movie excels where it needs to, with story and emotion, so well for me that none of that matters. <laughs> In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Why bother? Because it's right. 
I pretty much always prioritize story above all else with whatever I'm watching. Story will typically outweigh everything for me, even if it's a children's show. I've always been drawn to story, specifically grounded stories. And that's not to say there aren't any exceptions, but for the most part, that's how I roll. For example, that's why Hey Arnold was one of my favorite cartoons as a small child, because it has stories very rooted in reality that pump so much life and relatability into these cartoon characters. In Spider-Man, Raimi essentially takes live action cartoon characters and paints a picture of Peter Parker as a real guy living a real life with real problems in the gritty city, basically giving the film a more serious and realistic tone. <laughs> for the most part, in keeping it grounded and centered around Peter's mundane life, his coming of age, and humanity is ultimately what elevates Spider-Man. And Raimi knew that that was the right approach to take with this specific hero. I try to always be true to the character of Peter Parker and um, deal with him honestly, like in any dramatic motion picture. Sometimes in the comic book movies, uh, they take a step back from reality even when dealing with the characters. But I decided to take a different approach and um, make it as real as possible so that the audience believed they, that they could believe in this hero, in this man. And um, that was really my guide all the way through the performance pieces. Something I really love about Raimi's Spider-Man is how much emphasis is put on the realities of being Spider-Man. I want him to have a lot of personal problems. All the problems. You want him to have problems? Personal problems. Stan Lee constantly spoke about how many everyday problems he wanted Peter to have because they made Spider-Man more unique and relatable in comparison to other superheroes. He's probably more like a regular person, a normal person than any other character. And I try to make him that way because I guess until Peter Parker, no superhero or no superhero's alter ego had ever had to worry about making a living. I'd like a job, sir. Um, getting along well with girls, being popular. I, I made him a guy who is very introspective. I gave him a guilt complex. He felt his uncle had died because he hadn't captured this original burglar who ended up killing his uncle. I I'm rather proud of that. The fact that Peter, like any normal human being, had self-doubts and concerns. We all have these problems. I mean, think about it. The concept of Spider-Man is smothered in responsibility, which was thrust upon Peter out of nowhere, completely by chance, and now he has to deal with it. Being Spider-Man is going to consume the greater part of his life, and Raimi always doubles down on the repercussions, the realities. And we start to see the effects almost immediately in this movie. On his very first day of having powers, Peter is so caught up experimenting with them that he accidentally bails on Uncle Ben and their plan to paint the kitchen together. This is such a brief story beat, but it always felt significant to me. It's like the very first hint that these two lives are not going to be easy for Peter to balance. I get so upset that he left Ben hanging like that. And Ben was so sweet and thoughtful to leave a note about saving some meatloaf for Peter in the oven. Like these are very small details that probably didn't need to be included, but Raimi included them because it all adds up. It builds a grounded world. And I really love the casting for Peter's family. When you look at Tobey Maguire, Rosemary Harris, and Cliff Robertson together, they look like that real warm, loving family from down the street, you know? In this movie, Peter learns that the greater good is now one of his many problems. Since he's become superhuman, his problems have increased exponentially to match. Uncle Ben's death is the turning point for Peter. He remembers those immortal words Ben spoke to him. With great power comes great responsibility. And as pivotal as those words are, I'd like to highlight these as well. These are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. Just be careful who you change into. 
Be careful who you change into. It's cliche, but this is such a valuable lesson for young people. Your adolescence is really the most defining time in your life in so many ways, which is why I find myself drawn to coming of age stories about teen and young adult characters because there's something so special and pivotal about those years. It's such a small bubble of time in your life that can never be replicated. Everything you experience during those years shapes you as a person, be it consciously or subconsciously. Every emotion you experience feels all-encompassing. And you're always living in the moment because time moves so much slower due to you having less responsibility. This is exactly where we find Peter at the beginning of his journey. So when he lashes out at Uncle Ben and says something that he definitely doesn't mean... And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. I get it. It happens. Peter is too wound up and annoyed because Ben is keeping him from running off and going after his main priority, which is to use his powers to win money, to buy a car, to impress Mary Jane. This is a very teenage idea. And even though Tobey Maguire was like 26 years old playing a teenager in this movie, he still managed to bring this awkward, youthful spirit to the character. Like, I do believe that he's a teenager. I do. Toby brings a very earnest performance to an already very earnest movie. Gee, did I say that? And because this movie is so earnest, I can understand why Spider-Man might come across as cringy to some people today. But I think that's mainly because it's so unaffected by this change in culture that we've experienced in recent years. As a society, we have become increasingly cynical. And I think we either look for or just expect a reflection of that in our entertainment. So to me, Raimi Spider-Man isn't really cringy. It's just coming from a place that is so innocent and wholesome without trying to be. It just is. He throws up his hands, ropes come out, and he climbs up the ropes like a spider web. It's part of what makes it so much fun. Many modern blockbusters lean heavily into sarcasm, to the point where sarcastic lines are just flying left and right from most of the characters. No one is like that in this movie. Except for maybe J. Jonah Jameson, but even he's not really like what we get today. No one is putting on sarcastic, cocky facades and spitting jokes every few minutes. And I don't know, there's something about that modern sarcasm thing that just doesn't click with me. Whenever I watch a movie, I find myself wanting to press play, go on a journey, feel throughout that journey, and be emotionally moved by it in some way by the time the credits roll. This is no doubt a lifelong side effect of Titanic being my favorite movie of all time. And speaking of Titanic... There is an amazing connection between Sam Raimi's Spider-Man and James Cameron's Titanic, which I saw for the first time when I was only five years old back in 1998. It was one of those life-changing movies for me and really informed my opinion on film, what movies can be, and what they're capable of. Something completely unknown to me at the time is that James Cameron was originally set to write and direct Spider-Man. He even wrote a pretty sizable scriptment for it, which screenwriter David Kep and Sam Raimi were both very inspired by and actually incorporated some elements of into their film. Like organic webs, for instance. I know, we're getting into some controversial Spider-Man territory here, but hear me out. I've always personally preferred organic webs to the mechanical web shooters. It contributes to this idea of Peter fully becoming Spider-Man, as opposed to partially creating Spider-Man, if that makes sense. Mechanical versus organic web shooters might seem like a small detail, but it really affects my enjoyment of the story. And I don't know if that's just me. Raimi perfectly sums up exactly how I feel in this clip here, so I'll just let him do the talking. He's really a kid that we identify with. And this kid is vested with these powers, or perhaps cursed with these powers. But the important thing is he's one of us. Now, in the comic book, which I'm a giant fan of, he is a genius. And we're going to keep that. He's a very smart kid. Uh, but 
when he can develop a material that even 3M Corporation can't seem to develop, it starts to distance him from a real human being. It distances him from the average kid in high school. We felt it was a logical progression to let him also spin his own webs. And in that way, keep him a complete human being that we could identify with and being consistent with, well, once he's bitten by the spider and takes on all of the powers, why not, why just take on four of the five? Why not just take on all five? That it's a great choice, and it was inspired by James Cameron's treatment. I think it's a great choice to help alienate him, to make him feel cut off, and to, to really embrace the spirit of who Spider-Man is, this misunderstood hero who's an outcast, who's cursed with these powers. To me, having organic webbing makes Toby Spider-Man a complete Spider-Man who can do whatever a spider can. Like he really is a human spider. Fully becoming is far more relatable and honestly believable to me, and I've always found that more compelling. I know it sounds crazy that Peter gaining the power to naturally shoot webs is more believable to me than him crafting web shooters, but it is. It was also apparently James Cameron who wanted to take Spider-Man seriously. Screenwriter David Kep is quoted saying, I had a lot of my own specific thoughts about what the movie ought to be, because I had been a Spider-Man fan as a kid and young adult. But his treatment, it just took it seriously. It took Peter seriously as a character, and it took a superhero movie seriously as a genre, and you hadn't seen that before. Once again, I guess I kind of have James Cameron to thank for that too. Granted, there are a lot of things that I don't like about James Cameron's original script at all, and I don't think it would have worked if he had full creative control, but I still think it's oddly poetic that the writer-director of my favorite movie of all time had even the slightest influence on the one superhero movie that I've ever been drawn to and truly love. And I had no idea. Plus, word on the street is that Leonardo DiCaprio was originally cast as Peter Parker in James Cameron's version, and Leo has been very close friends with Tobey Maguire since they were kids. And of course, Tobey was cast as Peter and Leo was cast as Jack in Titanic, so it all goes full circle. It all connects and it just makes sense. It feels like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man was personally made to be my favorite superhero slash Spider-Man movie. And we all probably have our own favorite Spider-Man movie because different versions can and will continue to exist. I love that there are different versions of Spider-Man. They shouldn't all be the same. It's good to have some variety and I will always enjoy a Spider-Man movie to some degree. I just personally find myself more drawn to what Raimi brought to the table. Since Spider-Man and Peter Parker are so relatable, I think anyone who likes Spider-Man will automatically create and build up their own personal version of the character in their head. And that's okay. So it just feels so futile to me to have all of these Spider-Man arguments, even though I know we all have very strong opinions and we're all free to share them. I've been sharing mine for however many minutes, I don't even know. There are so many iterations of Spider-Man at this point. I think we can all have our own personal Spider-Man. To me, Spider-Man and Peter Parker is a true individual. He's independent. He deals with his problems himself. He works as Spider-Man alone. He's kind of a loner. <laughs> And so am I. Like I said at the start, I'm trying to figure out what aspects of Spider-Man reflect parts of myself. He was given such strange powers, but even without showcasing his smarts by having him create a physical scientific device, I still think he's so ingenious to come up with ways to defend New York City with these unique abilities and acrobatic fighting style. It's so cool and it has a little bit of an edge to it. So. I guess he was always sort of a rebel to me too, and I know that my edgy wannabe emo tween age self must have related to that at some point. Due to this movie being my first exposure to Spider-Man and the version that shaped my opinion on the character, Spider-Man movies really excel for me when they focus on that human aspect and do it in a really honest and human way. You do too much. College, a job, 
smoke all this time with me? You're not Superman, you know. <laughs> For the entire film, Peter is basically balancing his personal struggles with fighting local crime and eventually the goblin. The climax of the movie is Spider-Man being forced to choose between saving Mary Jane or a cable car full of kids. It revolves around a choice. This is so small in the grand scheme of things. This isn't a worldwide catastrophe, but that doesn't matter. The situation doesn't feel small because Raimi built a grounded world where stuff like this is a big deal. It's still a matter of life and death wrapped up in a choice. We are who we choose to be. Now choose! Peter being bitten and becoming Spider-Man, that was fate. But now he has to navigate that and will be faced with a multitude of choices. Spider-Man is still a human under the mask. And in the end, Spidey does everything in his power to do the right thing, finding a way to save both MJ and the kids. But for a second there, you really don't know how it's gonna play out. That scene segues straight into the final fight between Spider-Man and the Goblin, and it is so brutal. It's so quiet, it's small scale once again. It's just a flat out fist fight. And there's not a single moment where you don't feel like Spider-Man isn't actually getting beaten to a pulp. And you can tell that Sam Raimi's background in horror films definitely helped pull this sequence off in a really authentic way. To see our hero so defeated hurts. And we're once again reminded that this guy is still a human in that suit. He is not totally indestructible, but it's his desire to do what's right that keeps him going. It's what gives him the energy to keep fighting until the goblin quote unquote surrenders, revealing himself as Norman Osborn, the father of Peter's best friend. That's a lot to take in. The way Peter and Norman's stories so personally connect in this way is what makes the Green Goblin the most compelling Spider-Man villain for me. That and Willem Dafoe's epic performance. <laughs> when Norman accidentally pierces himself with his own glider, he leaves Peter with a dying request. Peter, don't tell Harry. <laughs> This only deepens Peter's need to conceal Spider-Man's identity from those he's closest to. His best friend now believes that Spider-Man killed his father and vows to make him pay, while also believing that Peter is the only family he has left. The conflict. No matter how hard I try, the ones I love will always be the ones who pay. Raimi treats being Spider-Man as equal parts gift and curse. And the way he navigates the curse aspect is really what gives these movies the drama and edge that some other Spider-Man films lack for me. All I wanted was to tell her how much I loved her. I can't. I love ending the movie with MJ and Peter because it's just another thing that highlights character growth. MJ was a huge source of motivation for Peter throughout the entire film. He wanted to be with her more than anything. And in the end, she falls for him as Peter. Due to her broken home life, she spent the entire movie trying to please other people, other men specifically. Mary Jane kind of goes on this journey by herself because she comes from a, a very hard home life and she kind of covers it all up. And Peter's really the only man that she's shown a vulnerable side to and it's been out and he's accepted her for what she is. The movie gives us that big declaration of love from MJ and the kiss between her and Peter, but it doesn't feel happy. It is tinged with a sincere sadness. That level of maturity I've talked about comes into play here and brings us back down to reality. We feel for Peter and we feel for MJ. We're rooting for their happiness, but we still understand why Peter Parker walks away for her sake. If you didn't get it already, it really makes you fully grasp that being Spider-Man isn't a joke. It's not all fun and games. At the end of the day, you have to be selfless to a degree. It's the the not so glamorous part of being a superhero. For the movie to end on 
that note with a hint at Mary Jane's realization of recognizing Spider-Man's kiss in Peter's. Danny Elfman's score starting to swell. That voiceover quote from Peter launching into that final swing. It's honestly one of the best and most satisfying endings to a movie I've ever seen. It's enough to bring me to tears. It has brought me to tears before. <laughs> it's an ending that's emotional, definitive, wraps everything up, and makes you feel like you've gone on a journey. Because Peter goes on a journey, and he comes out the other side self-assured. He opens the movie with a pretty big question. Who am I? And by the end, we have our answer. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. But I wanted to be with the character and understand in each and every moment what he thought and what he wanted and what he was experiencing. So I didn't think that it was something that um, could be glossed over. I wanted him really to take a journey, a journey of growth into becoming this hero. And I wanted the audience to take it with him. So there were many steps to that journey, many moments that I felt had to be um, dramatized for the audience. And so it did take a while. What I love about Peter's journey is at its core, it's about a teenage kid simply growing up, becoming the man he's going to become the rest of his life. He has grown up to not only accept his new responsibilities as Spider-Man, but to embrace who he is in his identity as Peter Parker. Be a son to me now. I have a father. His name was Ben Parker. This is why his ripped mask is so effective in this scene, because we get to see both sides of himself at once in action simultaneously. And we see it in such a powerful way at such a powerful moment where he has truly come into his own. Sure, we've seen him in the suit without the mask on a few times, but there's something so powerful about seeing half mask half Peter. It just fully represents Spider-Man. So before we hit the conclusion, I can't do a video on Raimi's Spider-Man without praising Danny Elfman's epic musical score beautifully helps support the story. It perfectly captures the emotion, the drama, the sentimentality, the maturity, and the journey I've been talking about. You can feel that this was written specifically for Spider-Man. Not just for a superhero, for Spider-Man. From the very beginning, it hits a rhythm that evokes the image of a scurrying spider. Ah, uh, it's just perfect. Elfman's score, with just the main title theme alone, tells the whole story of Spider-Man with the gravitas it deserves. In fact, the Spider-Man 2 opening credits pairs the main theme with these gorgeous illustrations that perfectly recap the first film just amazingly. All you need to do is watch that to see what I mean. When I listen to that theme, it makes me feel so alive. It's one of those pieces that makes me realize how much I love and appreciate art and how awful this world would be without it. And I gotta say, one of the coolest things ever was when I blasted the Spider-Man main title in my headphones as I flew over New York on my flights to and from the city. It was quite exhilarating and I highly recommend. But it was also a little depressing because I kept hoping to see Spidey swinging from the buildings, but I at least got a photo at the Flatiron Building, which is of course the exterior for the Daily Bugle in the Raimi films, so... That was cool. So, on my quest to discover what it is about Spider-Man that I love so much, I think I just love and relate the most to just being who you are, embracing your talents and what makes you unique, just as Peter embraces what makes him unique and uses it for good. Spidey looks like the ultimate free spirit as he takes his final swing, and you get the sense that it's not just web swinging for the sake of web swinging. Even though the graphics are very 2002 and it isn't as technical or super modernized as other final swings, I think part of why Raimi's manages to hold up and remain so enthralling to watch is because it's so simple and timeless. It's just so dang cinematic. 
and it all adds up to a final swing that serves as a beautiful visual and emotional representation of living up to your potential and fulfilling your destiny. He never doubted the man you'd grow into. How you were meant for great things. We should all be so lucky to reach that level of self-actualization. Of course, in the sequel, Peter does not have everything figured out and has a full-on existential crisis, but for now, this is a movie that can stand alone and definitely leaves you with a weighty understanding of the origin and heart of Spider-Man. I titled this video essay, My Unlikely Hero, because just me being who I am, plus my near lifelong notorious relationship with superhero movies, you know, Spider-Man just always seemed like such an oddball among my favorite films. You would think that it just seems unlikely that I would ever watch Spider-Man, let alone like it. But now, after finally analyzing it, it's not unlikely at all that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is one of my favorite movies. All right, that was my video essay on Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a Spider-Man fan like myself, which I'm assuming you are if you've made it this far, you've probably watched one of the dozens, if not hundreds, of Raimi Spider-Man video essays here on YouTube. There's only so much you can say about these movies at this point, and everything always feels so necessary to mention again and again, you know? But every Spider-Man video essay I've ever come across has been done by a guy literally every single one. So as a millennial woman who also grew up with Raimi Spider-Man and loves this movie, I felt like that was reason enough to contribute to the conversation. And you know, there's so much more I could have gotten into, but this really wasn't supposed to be a movie review. In the first draft of my script for this, I originally dug deeper into a lot of other stuff and I shared many other controversial opinions, but I was just getting way too far off track and I needed to streamline it the best I could and really focus on what Spider-Man means to me and why I love Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, specifically as someone who doesn't particularly like superhero movies. I really tried to put as much of a personal spin on this thing as I possibly could, so I hope that that made for an interesting watch and maybe even a refreshing take. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you soon in another video, which I know will be on whatever my next obsession or re-obsession is. So until then, bye.